We're not just changing the way people look at church, but the way people look at faith and humanity. This is the FSC Global. <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? What's going on, y'all? Welcome. Welcome. Of course, welcome to the FSC Global, your digital pit stop, changing the way that we see faith and humanity. Listen, this is our final week of this really grueling series called Sin. Now, this series, uh, it's been grueling because it's been showing us a lot of us, which a lot of these series from this year have, have been doing, which I'm just recognizing that pattern, um, giving us a full look into our relationship with sin and how we can combat it uh, and getting a closer and better relationship with God. Uh, according to his grace, according to his mercy, according to his discipline, according to his statutes, according to his love. And um, this week, let's dive into something interesting, okay? I, this will be a really interesting one. I want you to go to Exodus. Yes, this is the story of Moses and children of Israel and all this good stuff. But go to Exodus, Exodus 7. Exodus 7, we'll start at verse number 1. All right, all right, all right. I'll be reading from the ESV. I think it's the ESV. I don't know. It's not titled. Anyway, <laughs> and it says, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of that land, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Woo! <laughs> Today we're going to be speaking from the subject, the Pharaoh in me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, change our perspectives this day. Change our, uh, the ways that we think. Change the way uh, that we've always seen things and help us to see things the way you see them from all perspectives. Help us to see things uh, the way our neighbor sees them sometimes. Help us to change the way that we look at things and uh, in different ways to look at you differently, to look at us differently, and to look at our relationship with you differently. Be in this word. Actually, don't just be in this word. Be this word. Every word that comes out of my mouth. We love you. We honor you. We need you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, so the Pharaoh in me, the reason why this, this uh, we're speaking from the subject of Pharaoh in me is because every single time we speak from this story, the story about Moses and Pharaoh, Egypt, children of Israel, let my people go, all of that good stuff, we all were always looking at it from the perspective of Moses and the children of Israel and Aaron. They're trying to get out of Egypt, go to their own land of milk and honey and all that great stuff. We, we talk about Moses going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, how he had a stuttering problem, how he was their leader and everything like that. But how many times have we ever looked at this story from Pharaoh's perspective? Now, since Pharaoh became Pharaoh, like, Bro been wildin', like he's been really wildin'. He's completely disrespected the children of Israel, tried to make them their slaves, conquer them and all that good stuff, has no respect for Joseph and all the things he did for Egypt. He's just like, listen, all these people, they need to go, kill all the kids as under two, all the boys as under two. This is actually how the story started in Exodus. And now we're at the point where Moses is grown and Moses is touched by God and chosen by God. Say, hey, take these people out of here. Now my people have to get out of Egypt. And Moses goes, him and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh, say, hey, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, because think of it like this. If you have benefited 
from something or someone for such a long time. And then magically out of nowhere, they come and they say, hey, I think I want to go out on my own. I think I want to leave you. How susceptible will you be to letting them go? It's so interesting that when, uh, when Moses and Aaron come to Pharaoh, they say the phrase, let my people go, as if he has the power to either let them go or not let them go. The thing is, as people, as human beings, as believers, we could be of service to something or someone for so long that we often trick ourselves and them into believing that they own what we do, that they own who we are. We've done this for so long that it's like it's second nature that us doing something differently just doesn't register well. Bro, and that's not even the craziest part. The wildest part is God is telling Moses and Aaron, he's telling Moses and, you know, Moses is going to tell Aaron, of course. He's telling him, yo, go to him, tell him to let your people go, but know this, I'm going to harden his heart so that he's not even going to listen to you. Wait a minute, what? For everything that Pharaoh has done throughout Exodus, from Exodus 1 up until Exodus 7, you mean to tell me that his heart wasn't already hardened? From God's perspective, he's like, Pharaoh, I have given you chance after chance after chance after chance. This is, this is, this is Old Testament God now. You don't want to mess with him. So I've given you chance after chance after chance, and you keep trying to kill my people. Bro, what is wrong with you? So now we're in chapter 7, and we've gotten to the point where Moses is a grown adult male. He's like in his 40s or something. And you've been doing this to these people for, the, for a long time now, for decades. And now I'm sick of it. And I'm going to harden your heart. I'm telling Moses, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. So he's not even going to hear what y'all are saying. But I need you to say it to him anyway to get my people out of Egypt. Now, there may not be a physical or visible threshold that God has to say how much of something that we can do before he like, man, I'm about to punish you. We may never know what that meter looks like. But when God say he, he finished, he finished. <laughs> I mean, God is making his move on behalf of the children of Israel as we speak. He's telling Moses everything he wants, he wants him to do, and he's letting Moses know that Pharaoh's not going to listen. Have you ever been told to do something and then told that what you're going to try to do ain't going to work by the same person? I would be confused in the mob. I, then what's the point of me going up there? But of course... God knows stuff that we just don't know. <laughs> God is telling Moses, listen, yeah, I'm going to tell you to go up there, let my people go. He ain't going to hear y'all. I'm going to do things to him. I'm going to put my hand on Egypt, and he's still not going to listen. That's how hard I'm going to harden his heart. Now, looking at it from a different perspective, have you ever had a hardened heart and not know it? Now, in a hardened heart, meaning that there are things that you are supposed to feel adhere to and respond to that you just don't. There's empathy and sympathy that you no longer have. There's a clinical narcissistic selfishness that you possess that you aren't even aware of because you're never even aware of the people around you. Today we got to talk about the Pharaoh and us. The parts of us that no matter what God says or does to us, we just won't listen to him. The parts of us that ignore all the signs, wonders, and words that we get from him that we just feel like we're just going to do what we want to do. The parts of us that operate unknowingly in the hands of the enemy. You see, the Bible calls it hardening of the heart. We just call it hard-headed. But bro, oh, this is how much God loves us. Even in our hard-headedness, God will send us things to attempt to put us back on the right path. He'll send people, he'll send words, he'll send signs, he'll send wonders, he'll send whatever it needs, to, whatever it needs, whatever, it, whatever you need to get your head back in the game, he's going to send it. And in order to do that, sometimes God will use acts of judgment. What's so interesting is when, when it comes to our disobedience to God, our, our hard-headedness, our sin, 
God's acts of judgment are almost like they're almost like two part, right? There's the discipline of it, right? Like the beating, the whooping, <laughs> the whooping part. And then there's the grace part. The part that says, you know this could have been a whole lot worse, right? The part that says, hey, I'm gonna whoop you, but I still love you, and I'm gonna let you know why I did what I did. The, the, the grace that says, I'm gonna give you another shot at this. There's the discipline, and there's the grace. And they're not always, like, side, but they're not always one before the other. It's not always like grace and then discipline or then discipline, then grace. Like some guy, sometimes God be switching it up on us. And in this, this particular moment, Pharaoh has done so much that now God has to get his attention by these acts of judgment. And these acts of judgment come by way of what we call the 10 plagues of Egypt. Each plague more harsh than the last one and Every plague, they end up losing something in Egypt. But what I didn't know until I was studying is that every single plague had like this little smidge right here. You can't see it, but it's like small. It's a little smidge of grace attached to it. Now, what kind of God do we serve that even someone like Pharaoh, who had been executing and putting into slavery and killing and murdering and doing all these things for as long as he reigned in Egypt, God would still have this amount of grace for him. What kind of God is that that we serve? And I ask that because we be thinking, man, as soon as I do something wrong, God go leave my side forever. You know, my wife had said something to me a few nights ago. We were just talking on the couch and she just says, listen, like, God ain't petty. God ain't like us. And of course, like when she said it, like we started laughing and everything because, you know, to think God is petty, is just that's hilarious. But to really dig deep into knowing that God isn't petty and he don't think like us when it comes to vengeance. He don't think like us when it comes to getting even. He don't think like us when it comes to being done wrong. He don't think like us, period. And when she said God ain't petty, it really made me think about our perspective in the children of Israel when it came down to Moses and Pharaoh. If God was petty, he would have wiped everybody out and say, you know what, y'all ain't even, y'all, children of Israel, y'all ain't even gotta get out of Egypt. I'm just gonna wipe everybody out here and y'all can stay here and just live. But that's what would happen if God was petty, but he wasn't. God is strategic. God has strategies that we can't even fathom. God has plans that we don't even think of even having. God has things lined up for us and we just like, whoa, because we think that we got the best plans. We do. A lot of times we think that we have the best plans. And the way that he has to show us things sometimes hurts. Man. So God rains down these, these 10 plagues in Egypt. The very first plague, uh, he turned water into blood, right? Now, just imagine you waking up in the morning, you know, you go get your glass of water out the refrigerator or out your, your filter and says, or, or, or your bottle of water, whatever, and you go to drink that water and it's red. And the water that you're trying to drink has now turned into blood. You don't know where this stuff came from. But recognize that water is symbolic to our life system. Over half of our body is made of water. Over half of this earth is covered in water. We could go days, weeks, probably even months without eating, but we can't go for a few days without water. So to turn your water into blood is almost like sentencing you to death. It's gonna get real. The citizens of Egypt could no longer drink from the Nile. Not just Pharaoh, not just his, his workers, not just his soldiers, but the people of Israel, even the ones who ain't never did nothing to the children of Israel, can no longer drink from the Nile. They can't bathe. They can't wash their hands. They can't wash their clothes. Think about the most important resource in your life being completely cut off from you at a moment's notice. That's the discipline. That's the, that's the beating. That's, that's the, the whooping part, right? Here's the grace. Biblically, blood represents new life. The blood of Jesus. <laughs> they took blood oaths. Blood is a representation of a renewing. 
So yeah, we look at it as our, our most important resources being taken away from us, but sometimes we don't see the grace of God in it that's showing us that there's a renewing that has your name on it, but a lot of times we don't want it because we don't like how it looks and we don't like how it feels. Man. The next, the next plague was uh, frogs, right? So frogs, frogs are just everywhere, ribbit, 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 just, just everywhere. And, and frogs were, and sometimes today still are, um, a representation of repulsiveness and a representation of unclean spirits. We call them demons. And that was the second plague in Egypt. What's interesting is during that time in that culture in Egypt, Frogs were a sacred creature. One of Egypt's deities called Haka was a frog-headed goddess who was said to have a creative power. So the citizens of Egypt, the people who don't know what's going on between Moses and Pharaoh, they think that this Haka, this, this goddess, is punishing them for something that they did. That's the discipline. But here's the grace. Look it up. Frog skin is said to have and possess healing and health properties. Now, for anybody who's ever had anything healed on your body, your mind, broken the bone or whatever, the beginning parts of your healing is always ugly and dirty. But it's also so interesting how the dirtiest things possess the most power to heal. Frogs, dirt, Mud, manure, all have healing properties. That's the grace. Now, the third plague was gnats. Now, anybody who be outside in the spring, out here in Atlanta, you know a little something about gnats, right? These little blood suckers that, that take your blood and leave a welt, take, take your life force and, and leave, a, uh, leave a scar on you. It's interesting that gnats are so annoying. Oh man, they're so annoying. There, there was this, uh, this ancient, ancient saying that said, uh, said uh, strain at a gnat, swallow a camel. It's said to uh, be symbolic to how sometimes we'll use a, an immense amount of force to swing or to beat at the small stuff and not enough force to beat the big stuff. That's the, uh, that's the discipline, that's the beating, that's, that's the whooping. But here's the grace. The Nats teaches us two things that we are often deficient of. Nats teach us tolerance and Nats teaches us patience. There's the grace. How graceful is a God that you have fought against, that you have been disobedient to, to give you an opportunity to be more tolerant and be more patient. Man, God is dope. Then there's the fourth, uh, there's a fourth plague. What is the fourth plague? Fourth, oh, fourth plague is flies. F flies are a representation of foolishness and a lack of God's direction. It's decay, it's destruction, it's a lack of God's presence. Flies just go around spitting on people, leaving stuff on you. But it's interesting that the flies uh, in, the, in the scripture were used to separate these people from God. Imagine being marked and covered by something so many times that you are no longer recognizable to the people who know and love you. That's what the flies in this plague are doing. But here's the grace. We rarely ever know like the staying power of God and God's presence until it's no longer there. There's this old, old saying that says uh, they don't appreciate your presence in their life until it's no longer available to them. And that's real, especially when it comes to God. But the craziest part here, Pharaoh's still not getting it. So guy, guy like, you know what? I'm giving you the discipline. I'm giving you grace. I'm giving you the judgments. Let me send a little bit more your way. What's number five? Number five, the plague of number five is the death of their livestock. This is the way people ate. This is the way people made money. When we, it's crazy. When Pharaoh was out of the will of God so badly, God began to affect his pockets. How he got paid. How he ate. How the entire country ate. This was their livelihood. 
That's the discipline. Here's the grace. In everything that they made money with, none of it spelled out that their making money, their livelihood depended on God. But for God to highlight the need for the dependence of our relationship with him, whew, that's graceful. Because he could have just took it all. Toe. Number six. The, the sixth plague was boils. All right. So with these boils, boils represent um, testing. And the boils represent disease. Um, Job and King Hezekiah faced similar tests. But during their testing period, they did not turn away from God. They were tempted to. It was close. <laughs> but they didn't turn away from God. What this, the boils plague, what it, did, what it does, is it shows us how the affliction of disease shapes and affects our relationship with God in the purest way. And I say the purest way because we really never know the extent of our relationship with anything or anyone until it's tested. The boils are the testing. How good is your relationship with God? If this happens to you, are you going to blame him? If this happens to you, are you going to turn away from him? If this happens to you, are you going to walk away? The grace in all of this is if we are to pass this particular test, everything that we've ever lost would be redeemed. There's evidence of that in, in Job's life. There's evidence of that in Hezekiah's life. There's evidence of that in just about everybody who was tested in the Bible. The, the same grace that was extended to Jonah is now being ex extended to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. Grace. Number seven. Uh, plague number seven is hail. You know those like big old rocks that be dropping from the sky. Do, 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 do. Break your windshields and all that stuff. Covered the entire country of Egypt. Just hail and boom, 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 boom. Now, hail represents the wrath of God. Biblically, it's, it's, it's sent to punish the wicked. Which, you know, kind of makes sense. Like, if I'm, bro, if I'm God and I didn't sent six plagues to get your attention and you still got that heart to heart, I'm like, bro, you about to get, you about to get this wrath. <laughs> you about to get this wrath. So the hell is just coming and it is destroying everything it touches because it's so hard. It's falling from so far. These are almost like live bullets raining from the sky. That's the punishment. That's the whooping. That's the discipline. Here's the grace. When the hail touches the ground and it melts, it soaks into the ground, it replenishes the lakes, the rivers, streams, water reservoirs. Remember when I said the first plague was turning water into blood? Well, here comes that grace giving you some of that water back, replenishing your plants, <laughs> sustaining animal life, sustaining human life. Here comes some of those things back that you lost prior to. It's so, right? It's, wow. My human brain will never understand how graceful God is. That even when he's punishing me, he's sustaining me. That's grace. Poof. Now, number eight. These, listen, <laughs> these plagues are getting realer and realer. All right? So, uh, plague number eight is locusts. Uh, anybody who knows anything about locusts is locusts, uh, kind of like hyenas. They eat anything. They eat everything. Their entire life, life goal is just to consume, right? They come and they take everything. The locusts will eat everything that you have. Now, these locusts covered the entire country, eating and taking everything. Everything that, 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 the, that the blood uh, didn't take everything that the flies and the gnats didn't take everything that all these other plagues didn't destroy all the way the locusts have come to take it and they are taking everything God is like listen if I got to strip everything from you to get your attention that's what I'm gonna do that's the whooping that's the that's the punishment that's the that's the discipline here's the grace if captured this is good if a locust is ever captured, locusts possess so much iodine and phosphorus and iron that it can replenish anything that is ever eaten. 
So if ever captured, all these locusts that's covering the country, if ever captured, you can extract everything that they've taken away. Bruh, this is a physical manifestation, or an insect manifestation, of the Proverbs 13, the riches of the wicked being stored up for the righteous. <sighs> Bro, that's, that's grace. Oh, that's grace. All right, the ninth plague, because apparently the first eight wasn't enough. <laughs> the ninth plague was darkness. Uh, anybody used to be afraid of the dark? Just, just me? All right, I was afraid of the dark. Man, I think sometimes I still am, I don't know. <laughs> but darkness. Uh, imagine whether it's day or night, you cannot see. Can't see what's in front of you. Can't see what you're doing. Can't see yourself going to the bathroom. Can't see yourself eating. Don't know what you're eating. Darkness is the biggest representation of having absolutely no relationship with God and knowing you don't have a relationship with God. It's different that it's different if you've never known God. It's way different. If you've never known him, you don't know what you're missing. But if you've had a relationship with God, you know what that relationship is like. You've benefited from that relationship. And now there's nothing? Oh, you gonna struggle. Just thinking about it got me struggling. God, dog. That's the darkness. That's the whooping. That's the, that's the beating. That's the discipline. Here's the grace. There is no better time to start depending on God than when you can no longer feel or see him. That is, there's no better time than that. It's easy to depend on God when he shows up every time you want him to, when you know when he's going to show up. But how easy is it to, to depend on God when you can't see anything and now you have an opportunity to do so? That's grace. Goodness gracious. Ten. Because apparently the first nine wasn't enough. <laughs> the, um, the tenth plague was... Uh, Death of the firstborn. Death of the firstborn. Um, now, when we, uh, when we speak of death of, of the firstborn, we can often think of the death of our children, um, which if taken literally, that's exactly what that is. And sometimes it has been. But when, when biblically, when it says death of the firstborn, firstborns represent the most love the number one love, the inheritance in which you give everything to. Firstborn gets everything that you have because you trust his firstborn with your legacy. There are things in our lives that we trust and love more than God. Wow. And you know God, he ain't gonna let that happen. <laughs> So, you got to give your firstborn. It's not even giving your firstborn. It just says the death of your firstborn. It has to die. Because if we willingly and knowingly choose to love something or someone more than we love God, we are saying to him that he is second, that he is not first, that he is not omniscient, that he is not omnipotent, he's not all-knowing, he's not all-seeing, he's not all-powerful. But this thing that we put in first place is. And God is saying, nah. I'm taking that away too. That's the discipline, that's the whooping, that's the beating, it's the punishment. Here's the grace. If you ever know that something is good for someone, but they can't see it yet, and it's not even about you showing them that this is good for them, but it's more so of them discovering of how good it really is. The grace here is God gives us an opportunity to really discover His goodness when we don't have all these other things in the way of it. God knows he the best thing since sliced bread. God knows that he's our everything. God knows all this stuff. But think about how much more it means to him when we know it and when we act like it and when our actions and our words line up with how good he is. Bro, this word here is changing my life as I speak. I almost cussed just now. I do that when I get excited. <laughs> God's grace is so... I can't... I don't even have a word to explain it with. It's... It's good. 
it's great, it's grand, it's wonderful, it's powerful, it's, his grace, his grace is merciful, and we can't pay for his grace, we can't find ways to earn his grace, we, his grace is, it, that's, my, that's how much he loves us, but the objective of sin is to separate us from him and his grace so much that we can't even recognize his grace when it's right in front of us. That we can't tangibly feel or touch his grace even when God is presenting it to us. Sin's objective is to pull us so far away from God that we feel like we can't even accept his grace. We can't accept his goodness. We can't accept his mercy. Sin makes us believe that we are doomed to whatever punishment that may come our way and that we're going to get it because we deserve it. That is what sin does. The wages of sin is death. But the job of sin is separation. Father God, in the name of Jesus, help us beat sin by accepting your grace. Help us beat sin by accepting your love. Help us beat sin by accepting your mercy. Help us beat sin by us actually digesting and accepting our relationship with you. Give us the strength and the ability and the wisdom and the knowledge and the patience and the tolerance to really beat sin in the ways that you would have us to beat it. Us beating sin isn't going out demon killing, so to speak. But it's how we treat our relationship with you. It's how we pay attention to our relationship with you. It's how we commune with you. It's how we spend our time with you. It's how we discipline ourselves to spend time with you. Show us you by showing us us. And give us grace for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. You are whatever word that is. Man, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, 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 hey. We love you. God love you so much more. Go out there and create something. Take it easy on yourself. This is the FSC Global.